Greetings, friends. I'm Pastor Del Keeney of the Mechanicsburg Church of the Brethren. And on behalf of our community of faith, I am pleased to welcome you to this time of reflection and worship. We are gathering on the third Sunday of May, 2021, and the seventh Sunday of Easter in the Christian Church year. However you are joining us, whether in person, on site, through our Zoom gathering, or through one of our online services, we are pleased and grateful that you have come. We are thankful for the music that has already guided us toward this time of worship. Our time will be given further shape as we share scriptures that reflect on the experience of the early church community as they lived with the reality that Jesus, who had been with them, who had guided the lives of the first disciples, was no longer present in body, but continued to give shape to their life together. This morning I begin with a reading from 1 John. Chapter 5. I'll be sharing verses 5 through 13. I remind you that in this text, we have a community of believers who have experienced some loss because others who have been a part of their church community have left through disagreement in how they have understood the witness of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To those who remain, the writer of 1 John speaks this testimony to encourage them, to remind them of the central truth of their identity in Christ. I invite you to listen to his words. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Will you join me in prayer? 
In this time, O God, as we gather in these varied ways, may we be reminded by the testimonies of your word in the life of Jesus, in the death of Jesus, and in the resurrection of Jesus, that he is the Christ, and that eternal life is found in him. This day, as we consider the challenges of your followers, as they deal with his departure, and what life will bring next. May we be reminded of our own journey as the church and how it is that we seek to open ourselves each day to his will and his way. We pray for the guidance of your spirit that we might attend to all that you would have us to know and to experience all that will shape our lives for your purposes this day. Guide us, then, in the name of Jesus, the Christ, your Son, and our Lord, we pray in his name. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to join us in sharing in our opening hymn, number 12 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal, Come, Let Us All Unite to Sing. Join in this testimony of our faith. Let us all unite to sing, God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring, God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, let every heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love. our sins away, his spirit turned our night to day, and now we can rejoice to say that God is love, God is love, God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. How happy is our Says our spirits cheer, God is love. He is our sun and shield by day, our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way, our God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite. Our second scripture for the morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, and then verses 21 through 26. Fifteen verses in from the opening of this book of the Acts of the Apostles, we find that the disciples have just returned to Jerusalem from the hillside where they last saw their Lord Jesus, as he spoke to them and then ascended until he was hidden by a cloud. 
They've just heard the words of two white-robed messengers who told them that he would return as he went. They have been promised the Holy Spirit, but they have already received their marching orders. Once disciples, they are now apostles being sent, tasked with sharing the witness of their risen Lord with the world. What now? They've come back to Jerusalem, gathered in an upper room. And then in a few short verses, we find Peter speaking in this way. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. And he said, friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Let us ponder it as we listen to this morning's musical interlude. Our final scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. The scripture is part of a larger prayer that Jesus prays, which is part of a larger conversation that Jesus has with his disciples that extends all the way from chapter 13 through chapter 17. Within the Church of the Brethren, of course, we remember 
that chapter 13 begins with that central practice that we recall each time we gather for the love feast, when the hour had come and Jesus stooped to wash his disciples' feet. But after he had done so, he goes on to speak to them about what life will be like and what he intends for them. And then he prays. There is no prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Gospel of John, like we know from the other Gospels. No plea from Jesus to have the cup taken from him. No, the prayer here is a very different prayer. Jesus giving thanks for all that God has revealed through him and all that will yet be done through him. And then Jesus praying for his disciples. We enter the text at this point. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified. In truth, this too is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy God, we hear the prayer of our Lord Jesus. And we know in that prayer he has deep desire that those who follow him might be unified with each other and with you and with him. He reminds us that his departure does not take us out of the world, but as he steps away from us, he empowers us to fulfill his purposes. This day we pray you will guide the one who speaks so that your word may be heard through him and those who listen that they may receive all that you have for them so that your word may give renewed shape and meaning and hope. 
to the lives of the followers of your Son, the Savior, the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Today we remember the ascension of Jesus, his departure from his disciples. It's hard for us to imagine what the experience was like for them to have their Lord and Master lifted up as he was. It's hard to find the comparison in our lives for when we send one of our loved ones, even in this pandemic time, to an airport, we fully expect that when they are lifted up, they will return. Even when we have considered those who have launched out through our atmosphere to reside for a time in the International Space Station, We expect them to return. For Jesus' disciples, who have gathered on that hillside, they are truly searching for last words of guidance, for it is hard for them to imagine when they will see their Lord again. Indeed, they're left gazing until they hear the voices of the two robed messengers who tell them that Jesus will return the way that he has gone. And then it's over. Then they head back to Jerusalem. Then that inner core of disciples gather in an upper room. It's a different gathering than the one they experienced before Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. That was a gathering of fear. This is a gathering of anticipation, but also a time of wondering, what will it be like What will it look like? How will we move forward without the presence of our Lord and Master? In the midst of that pondering, we have Peter taking charge. Peter directing the community to do its work. For one of the things that they've experienced is not only the loss of Jesus, but the loss of one of their number, Judas. But the focus is not on how terrible Judas was. Rather, Peter begins to acknowledge what Jesus has already said that it was necessary for one in some fashion to set in motion all that needed to happen. Judas was that one. And Peter refers to the Psalms, to the scripture that he has to give guidance. But ultimately, the conversation is not one to degrade Judas, but to find a way forward to fill his place so that these disciples, now called apostles in the scripture, may be prepared to be witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Well, you've heard the story, and you know that two were identified, and through the casting of lots, one was called. The one called was Matthias, And he was made one of the twelve. All of this happening before the Spirit comes in fullness 
in the book of Acts at Pentecost. A reminder that the church is at work amidst the movement of the Spirit as it seeks to understand its life in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, that is, in his bodily absence. Truth is, each of the scriptures that we have considered today invite us to think about the life of the church in the absence of Jesus. Yes, the text from Acts is self-evident. Jesus has just left. But in 1 John, we find also a testimony that though Jesus is not present, there are witnesses to all that he means for those who follow in his steps. The witnesses are the water, his baptism, the blood, his crucifixion, the spirit, a part of his resurrection in the Gospel of John. And speaking of the Gospel of John, we have this long section of the Gospel where Jesus is focused on preparing his disciples for what is to come. Now, some would say that Jesus spoke all of those words as he was preparing them, but it's a very different telling of the story than we hear in the other Gospels. Others would tell us that the story of Jesus' words is shared with us as a hopeful looking back, seeing how it is that Jesus prepared his disciples and his church for the future, how he was looking out for them before he had even gone to the cross. Looking back, we find his prayer for his people gives us hope. It is not a prayer that we would somehow be gathered up with him and taken away. No. It is a prayer that we might remain in the world, not to be of the world, to understand that the world may indeed hate those who love Jesus, but that we would understand that our place is to be in the world as his witnesses and in some fashion to continue to share the good news that is revealed in him. Yes, Jesus understands that the world is shaped by selfishness and evil, that there is rampant brokenness and hatred. And sometimes that hatred can be directed toward those who would seek to follow him. But he also knows that those who seek to follow him, who trust in him, who believe in him, can bear witness to the world in powerful and transforming ways. It is not by accident that the disciples get a new title, description, as apostles in the book of Acts. They are the ones sent out. And we hear quickly that it's not just 12, but 120. And we know soon that it is many others who continue to share the witness of Jesus. First, as we will remember on the day of Pentecost, to all those of the Jewish faith from so many lands who are united in their testimony by the Spirit. Ultimately, that message goes out to the Gentiles, those who are not qualified 
by their Jewish faith, but are still included in this witness and testimony that goes out to the world. 1 John rehearses the foundation of God's promises confirmed in Jesus and reminds us that sometimes it is hard to hold on to those core testimonies. For the community of 1 John has been divided over that. Some have come to believe, we're told, that the bodily life of Jesus is less important than his spirit. But the writer of 1 John reminds his community that God's promises are confirmed in water, blood, and spirit, that the risen Christ has given faithful testimony and revelation to them through his life and his real resurrection, as well as by the spirit that they have received at that resurrection. Ultimately, 1 John is reminding his community that they do have a witness to share, even in Jesus' absence, that Christ has a purpose for their lives and has given them a path of witness that they can trust. That is also the testimony we find in the Gospel of John. Jesus, in his own words, in his own prayer to God, testifies that his followers are equipped to share his testimony. The book of Acts provides us a real-life example of the community at work in Jesus' absence. They all remember the story of Judas. They could be embittered. They could be frozen in the damage that his betrayal has done. But they are listening to the heart and mind of Jesus. And they remember the actions both that led to Jesus' arrest, but also the promises of Christ. They reach back to the scriptures, Psalms in this case, and they put Judas' actions in perspective, and they allow the scriptures to guide their next steps, not to be locked in the past, but to move to the future that God has in store by restoring their full complement of apostles. While not yet the recipients of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they're already doing what is humanly possible to prepare themselves for their calling as witnesses. They take the brokenness of the past and they fill the vacant spot with another from their ranks to continue to extend the work as an apostle. On the eve of Pentecost, we do well to remember that Jesus also created a void in his departure. It is different, of course, than had he simply died. His resurrection gives them remarkable joy, but it is not unmitigated or unmanaged joy. He has given them the assurance that what he has taught them will continue to guide their lives and that his presence will be known and experienced in a new way through the Spirit. And then they go. As he goes, so they go. To find their way as his followers, as his church. And so we go. Having lived out our lives in his absence, but with the testimony of his presence. We continue to trust his words and word. We continue to be guided by his story and his actions. And we continue 
to be shaped by his spirit that brings us comfort and guidance and direction. Do we walk that path perfectly? Every community of faith struggles as it seeks to be faithful to Christ. We all need to go with humility on that path. And yet we can go in hope that the risen Lord continues to speak into our lives and that his sending and his witness continues to reflect in ours. No, we are not to be of the world. We have enough glimpses of the world around us and its tugs on our lives that we know that is not what we are called to be. But yes, we are to be witnesses to the world in how we act, in how we love one another, in how we share the good news, in how we live, in how we struggle, in how we stand firm, in how we suffer, if we must do so for the witness of Christ. It is a challenge to live in Jesus' absence, but we are not without his love or his grace. May we continue to bear witness to all that he is for us and for the world. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we remember this day that there came a time when you needed to depart, you described for us that being a necessity so that your spirit could come, the comforter, so that you might guide us in your way. There are many times when we would love to have you walking before us in body, Do not allow us to forget that you are still leading the way, both through your example and your words and by your spirit that leads us now. Forgive us when we lose confidence in your promises and guide us as we seek to be faithful in walking in your steps. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Friends in Christ, as we respond to the word that we have heard, I invite you to join together in singing this hymn, number 343 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal, My Hope is Built. Let us sing our testimony together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy on the Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand When the darkness fails his loving face I rest upon unchanging grace In every rough and stormy gale sand 
His oath is covenant and blood Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Not earth nor hell my soul can move I rest upon unchanging love I trust his righteous character His counsel promise and his power When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking Sand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, while Jesus is no longer with us in body, we testify that he is with us by his spirit, by his word by his example. May we trust that testimony and may we continue to live our lives in hope, in faithfulness, in humility, but also in confidence that as we tune ourselves to his way, that we can continue to be a witness to the world that he loves a world in which we may struggle, but a world in which we are called to serve. May you go this day open to his service, continuing his work. And may you go in Christ's peace. Amen.